And what st stuck with me at that time was that your translation and tafsir, your commentary, is focused on the imperative of social justice. There's a social justice message that the Quran projects that is relevant to all of humanity. We are now at a time where the genocide in Gaza and the expanded and extended war uh, imposed by Bani Israel on the rest of the people of the region speaks to certain verses in the Quran or rather those verses speak to the events of our day that evokes a certain level of um, anxiety among Muslims. They ask questions. There's a certain uh, level of confoundedness. But the verse I'm referring to in particular is Surah Al-Isra, verses 4 to 8, which have become the source of uh, speculation and engagement by many scholars um, with respect to the first and the second um, aggression by Bani Israel. Based on the commentary that you have in your, uh, in your uh, tafsir, could you expand on this particular uh, in, uh, discourse that is happening at the moment and how you see the truths and the revelation uh, in Surah Al-Isra verses 4 to 8 uh, relevant to the happenings in Palestine today? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen, wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin, wa ala al-ansari wal-muhajirin, wa ala man tabi'ahu ila yawm al-deen. Dear brothers, dear sisters, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi. The question that was um, directed to me um, requires quite some time. I don't know the time frame that we have here, um, but I will try as much as possible to explain this, especially as we are, we meaning the Muslims in the world, we, are, we have become <coughs> the targets of uh, a common enemies. And the Qur'an, uh, Allah's last words to mankind, is uh, rich with information uh, pertaining to social laws. The, words, the word in the Qur'an, sunnah, means social law. The plural sunan, social laws. And uh, this is one area that our, let's say, uh, learned uh, scholars uh, have much more uh, responsibility in explaining to the Muslim public uh, these social laws. Um, when it comes to our immediate challenge today, uh, of course, I think and I hope most of us are tuned in to the current affairs, especially uh, during the past year when uh, uh, the forces of Zionism and imperialism and those who are proxies, extensions and puppets of Zionism and imperialism, all of them have ganged up to try to uh, more or less take possession, immediate possession of their version of the Holy Land, which they say extends from the Euphrates River to the Nile River. That would include what is today known as geographical Palestine uh, parts of uh, uh, Syria, parts of Egypt, parts of uh, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Jordan itself, and um, parts of Iraq. So that is their plan, 
and uh, they seem quite intent, as you can figure out by listening to what's happening to our brothers and sisters in the colonized lands and in lands adjacent to that. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us uh, the information that is required to see through their um, smoke screens and their shenanigans. Uh, there are many ayat in the Qur'an that um, shed light on the nature of Bani Israel. Uh, many, many ayat. I, I haven't counted them, but I would venture to say between one-fourth and one-third of the Qur'an provides us with the necessary information to understand these types of people. Uh, history is a very uh, important lesson through which we can understand what is happening today. And we should not be uh, receiving or accepting versions of history that come to us from our uh, common adversaries and enemies. Unfortunately, uh, many of us have not paused and began to critically think through the words and the, um, and the lessons and the direction that is included in Allah's final scripture, Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem. Um, the ayat in Surah Bani Israel, uh, and I say Surah Bani Israel because um, the many centuries that have preceded us, uh, you know, there are certain surahs in the Qur'an that have uh, multiple uh, names or designations. And one of them is Surah Bani Israel, the 17th chapter of the Qur'an, the 17th surah of the Qur'an. And most of us know it as Surah Al-Isra. Uh, only a few of us know that it is Surah Bani Israel. Uh, so in this surah, at the beginning of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us about Bani Israel. The information that is contained there, of course, is much more understandable in light of what is happening today. Uh, but I think we should understand a little in context here. Uh, Allah Jalla wa Ala took his uh, subject, that's in reference to the Prophet, alayhi wa alihi salatu wasalam, he took him on a journey from Mecca to Al Quds. In the words of the ayah, min al masjid al Haram ila al masjid al Aqsa. And uh, there's meaning to that, meaning there's a relationship between al masjid al Haram in Mecca and al masjid al Aqsa in Jerusalem, al Quds. Uh, the, the, the journey, as it's called the nocturnal journey or the night journey, uh, could have just been from Mecca to as samawat al-Ula, to the highest elevations of existence, to Sidrat al-Muntaha. Uh, why was it via al-Quds, Jerusalem? Because there is an interactivity between the history of Bani Israel, who went foul and went wrong and went astray probably thousands of times in that history. 
And that's why we, uh, we have information from Allah's blessed Prophet. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his that there were tens of thousands of prophets and messengers who were sent to Bani Israel. If these were people who were honoring their relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal, they wouldn't have needed all of these prophets. But because in their nature they deviate, they have a wayward nature. So that required through the mercy of Allah, tabaraka wa ta'ala, that required that Allah send, sends them apostles and uh, emissaries to guide them when they go off course. So they are guided, and then they go off course, and then they are guided, and then they go off course. And that's become their permanent feature. This is, this is, it appears to me, this is a lesson that is lost on us because some of us, they think that, no, you know, we are in this Abrahamic thing together and uh, we can, you know, get along and all of this. Whoever thinks like that has abandoned the meanings that come to us from Allah Jalla Sha'nuh. Anyone who understands the Qur'an, understands the guidance in the Qur'an, will never entertain this type of notion. Forget about it becoming a policy and a strategy as some uh, rulers and their followers think uh, is possible. So... Uh, Allah subhanahu tells us that Bani Israel, the descendants of Israel, will cause chaos and corruption and instability two times throughout the course of history. وَقَضَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنَ This ayah is telling us, if, and this is what's required here, it's required for us to think of the information that Allah is relaying to us. So he's telling us they, these, this these types of people, and by the way, because their, their nature is so twisted that there's a majority of them at times and there's a minority of them, they're not all of the same mindset. But don't confuse the few who will show signs of receptivity to Allah with the many who display antagonism and aversion to Allah. This is one area that has been, uh, not been developed thoroughly in the contemporary Muslim mindset. Uh, there's an ayah uh, in, at the end of Surah Al-Saf that says, فَآمَنَ الطَّائِفَةُ مِّن بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلُ وَكَفَرَ الطَّائِفَةُ so if Allah is bringing to our attention that there is a possibility that a fringe group of Bani Israel will see the light, so to speak, then we have to be careful. But let's not confuse the forest for the tree or the tree for the forest. Back to the ayat in Surah Bani Israel. Allah says they are going to uh, have this type of ability to cause corruption on a worldwide scale twice in the span of human history. So the question is, when is the first time? Of course, if you uh, review the... Um, the attempts at explaining this by Mufassirin, 
by those who worked on explaining the meanings of the ayat in the Qur'an, you will discover that there are differences of ijtihad, differences of um, scholarly opinions about when this first time occurred. You're asking me. I answer to you that the first time this occurred was the clout and the influence that Bani Israel had when they killed and attempted to kill the last four prophets and messengers of Allah. Yahya, Zakaria, Isa, and Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon all of them. They managed to kill two, kill. Let that sink in. They killed prophets of Allah. And then they attempted to kill the last two. You can't do that from a position of weakness or if you're the victim that you always present yourself to be throughout history. Anyone tuned into their propaganda understands that they've been the victims of history and never were they in positions of command and control. But obviously you have to have much influence to be able to do that type of thing. So that, um, that position was demolished that first time around, was demolished and destroyed by the last Prophet of Allah, and the committed Muslims who were with him. As they were defeated in al Medina, you see, they came to, uh, before it was called Medina, it was called Yathrib. When they came to Yathrib, they had information that there's going to be an advent of the, the Messiah that they have been waiting for. They did not believe in the prophethood of Isa, alayhi salam, and they did not believe in the prophethood later on of Muhammad alayhi wa alihi salatu wasalam. They didn't believe in that. So they're, they're still waiting up until this very day and moment for the Messiah. So they were communicating with the Arabians in the peninsula because now they moved uh, to that Yathrib area. And uh, they were saying, we're awaiting the appearance of a prophet, etc. When the prophet came, then, you know, they had their antagonism towards the prophet, even though at the beginning, they signed the document of al Medina, Wathiqat al Medina, saying, you know, we acknowledge and we will live uh, on an equal basis. And the prophet gave them their uh, internal autonomy to go by the rules of the Torah that they have and honor their understanding of whatever scripture they had left among them. But they broke all of those agreements they had with the Prophet. Behind the scenes, they were collaborating with the Mushrikeen of Mecca. And when they proved their perfidy and their treachery, they lost their positions in uh, al Medina. They regrouped in Khaybar, and then when they were up to no good in Khaybar, the Muslims defeated them in Khaybar. They retreated to Al-Quds, and finally the Muslims defeated them in Al-Quds. So all of those centuries that they built up their, their control of the known world at that time, that's gone. The, the following ayat tell us, that they are going to make a comeback. And there's going to be a second time for their worldwide capability of corruption and um, uh, instability. And my understanding of it is we are living at this moment, the second time of their control of world events. 
And they are trying to control it in such a way that it, it, it will lead to uh, catastrophic consequences. As we, I mean, I, I hope I don't have to go and, you know, uh, concentrate your minds on what's happening in the Holy Land, what's happening in Ukraine, what could be happening in Taiwan, what could be happening in South America and different parts of the world. All of these avenues lead back to this concentration of power and wealth, which Beni Israel right now are pulling those strings. So Allah says in the ayah concerning this second time in, in which we are living right now, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ so when the second time comes to pass, وجوهكم, they, now the they here, this is a um, pronoun, it goes back to the word ibadan lana in the ayah before it. So those who defeated Bani Israel the first time around, Allah subhanahu, uh, defines them as ibadan lana. I want you. I want this word to uh, be taken into your minds and into your hearts. And the word ibadan lana means subjects who specifically belong to us. The us here is reference to Allah, Subhanahu wa Taala. There's no indication here of any sect, any nationality, any ethnicity, any race, any of these right now polluted concepts that are fueled by Bani Israel. Ibadan lana. The Prophet and his generation defeated Bani Israel the first time around because they were ibadan lana. And the second time around, it's going to say, it's going to take the same group of people, the same description of people who dedicate themselves, devote their lives, specifically to Allah, belonging only to Allah, regardless of what the propaganda and the odds and all of this other uh, type of misinformation that comes our way. So what are they going to do? وجوهكم, which means the imagery of Bani Israel, the facade of Bani Israel is going to be tarnished and exposed. وَلِيَدْخُلُوا الْمَسْجِدَ كَمَا دَخَلُوهُ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ And they, عِبَادًا لَنَا, will enter al-masjid, meaning al-masjid al-Aqsa, in al-Quds, Jerusalem, the same way they entered it the first time. How did Ibadan Lana enter Al Masjid Al Aqsa the first time? They entered Al Masjid Al Aqsa the first time because Bani Israel had retreated from Al Medina to Khaybar and then to Al Quds. And then eventually the Muslims, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his generation, they entered Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa after having liberated Mecca. They didn't, the, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, understanding instructions, directives, and guidelines from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, did not say knowing with all of these ayat that are revealed about Bani Israel, he didn't say, okay, let's uh, sort of uh, delay our liberation of Mecca and concentrate on following up 
and pursuing Bani Israel to Al-Quds. If you read carefully those chapters of our early Islamic history, you will obviously discover that Mecca was liberated before Al-Quds. And if, the, if our understanding of these ayat is accurate, the only way Al-Quds is going to be liberated is when Mecca is going to be liberated. How that is going to develop or play out, that's in the knowledge of Allah Jalla wa'ala. I don't know, but I know understanding this ayah that Mecca has to be liberated so that Al-Quds has to be liberated. Al-Masjid Al-Haram has to be liberated so that Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa can be liberated. And that's why at the beginning of the surah, Allah subhanah said, Subhana alladhi asra bi'abdihi laylam min al-Masjid Al-Haram ila al-Masjid Al-Aqsa alladhi barakna hawlah linuriyahu min ayatina innahu huwa al-Sami'u al-Basir. The first ayah in Surah Bani Israel. So there is a relationship, there is a connectivity between Al-Masjid Al-Haram and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Now the question that's probably roaming in some minds is, well, is Mecca or is it not liberated? That becomes the question you're going to have to understand and answer and solve yourself. When we look at Mecca, is Mecca what it's supposed to be? Al-Bayt al-Haram, the Kaaba, the Qibla, is it what it's supposed to be? Can anyone tell any Muslim in the world, you are forbidden from coming to Mecca? Is that a liberated Mecca? Is Mecca liberated when the number of Muslims who go to Mecca is predetermined by those who are in power. They say, well, you know, uh, there's a quota to come to Mecca. Who said? Which ayah, which hadith says there has to be a quota on population, you know, certain Muslim populations that are in certain countries? Well, out of those populations, we are only going to permit a small percentage of you to come to Mecca. Where did that come from? In Mecca today, I understand from people who went there and from others, that in, in the circumstances that we are in right now, we are, no one is permitted to wear a kufiya. You know the Palestinian kufiya? You all know what it is. If you wear that in Mecca as if you've committed a crime, is this a liberated Mecca? Is this the Mecca of Allah and His Prophet and the first generation of dedicated Muslims? Is this the Mecca? Or do we have to liberate Mecca? And these people who are in control of Mecca, I'm not mentioning any names. I know some people get a little nervous if we begin to mention names. But these people who are hiding behind the scenes right now, and uh, probably applauding the Zionists and the imperialists for killing our brothers and sisters, feeding them. Instead of feeding the people who need the food, they send caravans or they send uh, truckloads of food traversing the Arabian Peninsula and through the Mediterranean Sea to go to the Bani Israel, and the committed Muslims who are in Gaza or the West Bank or Lebanon or wherever they are who are standing up for what they're supposed to stand up for and we're supposed to be with them. Where's Mecca in all of this? Besides, you know, the, of course, the, what is called the Palestinian problem is the most important one among the many other similar and almost identical problems that we have around our Muslim geography. And what will happen if people think 
that by liberating Al-Quds, everything is going to, you know, uh, be solved. All these issues, we have the issues of the Muslims in Kashmir. We have the issues of the Muslims in China. We have the issues of the Muslims in, uh, in what used to be called Burma. Uh, we have dislocated Muslims. We have Muslims who are refugees in the hundreds of millions. What will happen in, 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 the, in the type of um, governmental sponsored misinformation, if we liberate Al-Quds, all, all these problems that we have are going to be solved. No, no. They're going to be solved when we liberate Mecca, which will be followed by the liberation of Al-Quds, which will be followed by the liberation of all the rest of the Muslims in the world, because we will have returned to Mecca is our heart. How can a body function when the heart is not working the way it's supposed to be? I think we all do know who they are, and uh, our publication certainly doesn't hold back on not mentioning names. We do name <laughs> where they need to be named. Before I ask Farid to proceed with the next question, I have been reminded that a Sinyan Quran, which is your tafsir, uh, is available for sale. Uh, for those who are keen on obtaining a copy, it's available for 100 Rand. It's a special price, and we'd like to ask everybody to support the sale of this particular uh, tafsir by Sheikh Muhammad al -Asi. Thanks, uh, Mahmoud. So uh, I just want to turn to you, uh, Zafar. And uh, if you can just show the uh, our audience, our guests. So is that the copy that's on sale? Okay. It's for 100 rands. Thanks, uh, Zafar. Zafar, I just want you to pick up from what Sheikh uh, Muhammad al has spoken about the contemporary uh, world, and of course, you know, uh, I think it was John Pulje who said, you know, that Palestine is the question. Uh, it is, it is central, uh, and as Sheikh has pointed out, you know, liberation of Mecca leads to the liberation of uh, Al-Aqsa. But maybe we should throw our focus and our eyes uh, wider, because it's all, you know, part of a colonial project. Um, if you can just, in terms of the contemporary challenges that face the Muslim world, and how do we, you know, of course we don't have all the answers, but at least a pathway to, to, uh, to addressing and challenging those uh, issues. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina wa Habibina wa Khatim al-Anbiya'i wal Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin wa ashabil muntajibin Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'm grateful to the organizers for giving us this opportunity to share some thoughts with you and as uh, brother Mahmoud and brother Farid pointed out uh, we have this uh, translation in English this is English only translation uh, of the noble Quran by Imam Muhammad al -Asi. of course prior to that uh, he has already produced uh, has worked on the tafsir of the Quran which is actually uh, absolutely historical because that tafsir uh, is the first tafsir ever produced directly in the English language. In 1500 years of Muslim history, uh, no scholar attempted to produce a tafsir of the Quran directly in the English language. All of the tafsir that you find anywhere were first either produced from Arabic to Arabic, Arabic to Farsi, Arabic to Turkish, Arabic to Urdu or other languages, and then they were translated from those languages into English. So they're actually third generation tafasir, and you can appreciate 
that if let's say there is a scholar who has a certain understanding of the message of the Quran that he has rendered into another language, then that scholar himself has not translated that tafsir from that language into the English language. So we are basically moving away and there are certain challenges uh, along the way in that. Uh, Imam al-Asi's tafsir, as I said, is unique in that he has actually, because Allah has gifted him with uh, knowledge, deep knowledge of the Arabic language, of the Noble Quran, as well as of English. And he himself has said on many occasions that, uh, you know, whatever our uh, mother tongue might be, uh, we tend to think in that language. Uh, so people born in the English speaking world would think in the English language. People born in the Arabic speaking world would think in the Arabic language. Now Imam al-Asi is in a unique position that he, his mother tongue is Arabic and he was born in America so he is fully conversant in both languages and of course he also studied Arabic literature, the Quran and Hadith and Fiqh etc. So he has command of both languages to be able to produce this unique tafsir. And later on of course we discussed the situation with respect to uh, producing a translation of the meanings of the Quran uh, so that that would serve as a gateway to the tafsir because obviously the tafsir being so deep uh, was proving to be challenging to many Muslims unless they were highly qualified scholars. So Imam al-Asi produced this translation which is Arabic and English and of course we felt that now this is of course for the Muslims but we felt that we needed to produce an English only version in which many Arabic words that are familiar to Muslims but they will not necessarily be familiar to non-Muslims so we thought we'll produce this so that it becomes easily accessible to non-Muslims to get the message of the Quran. And so we have produced this as Brother Mahmood mentioned, copies are available for a hundred rand. That's actually less than our printing cost, but we want to make this available to our brothers and sisters. In fact, what we would like to suggest before I come to the actual question is that uh, we would also like to get sponsors for this uh, Trans English only translation. Uh, you can help us with getting it into every household in South Africa. You can help us to get it into every library in South Africa, every university department in South Africa, uh, even to your governmental departments, whatever. And uh, our mission is uh, living in North America there are 2.3 million prisoners in the United States prison system. When we used to publish the Crescent International magazine in hard copy, we used to send copies of that magazine to prisons for free. Of course, this was sponsored. And we were surprised to learn that so many prisoners became Muslims simply by reading the Crescent International magazine. It was incredible, it was an eye-opener for us. Our aim and hope is to get at least 100,000 copies of these English-only translations of the Quran into the prison system, and you can imagine the impact that this is going to have. This is going to be your sadaqah jariya because you will benefit people, you will bring people into Islam, into the fold of Islam, propagate the message of Islam, and we have these forms available. We have set up the Ascendant Quran as a waqf, which is a charitable organization in the United States. Uh, it has a charitable number allocated to it. We have set up a bank account and you can transfer funds directly. We have a form that gives all the banking details that you can do it from here, from anywhere else in the world without any problem. So I hope that you will consider that uh, because this will be a tremendous help to the work that we are doing. Now let me come to the question that Brother Farid asked about the contemporary situation and let me preface that with respect to 
The theme that he had chosen, which is very interesting, I was very fascinated by it. It was the Quran, the media, and the signs of our time. You see, the Quran is Allah's revealed word. It is Allah's communication to humanity. And Allah had promised right at the time when he created the first human social being, Adam salam, and his uh, wife, his Zawj. And when they were sent to earth, of course, they were created for earth. They were not going to live in, in heaven forever, paradise. They were first spend a period of time on earth. When they were being sent down, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to them, فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا فَمَنْ تَبِعَا هُدَايَا فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ So Allah says to Adam alayhi salam and therefore to his progeny that guidance will come to you from me. And anyone and those who follow this guidance, those who live by this guidance, shall neither have fear nor shall they grieve. And implicit in this ayat is also the idea that if we do not follow this guidance, we reject it, we have a choice, Allah gives us that choice, but if we reject that guidance, then implicit in this ayat is that we will we must prepare ourselves for Allah's corrective justice. Not only in the akhirah, but in this dunya. And also we will face grief, definitely in the akhirah, but also over here. Now, when we look at the Muslim world today, and even societies like yours, South Africa, America, Canada, etc., where you know I live and Imam al Asi lives, uh, we have uh, a platform that unfortunately is not being utilized properly. You see, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, once he migrated to Medina, uh, he established uh, this platform of the Jum'a Khutbah. It's a very important platform, and it's, of course, at that time, uh, considered that to be the media outlet. You know, to do, today we have internet, we have the web, and we have Instagram, and all of these other platforms. Uh, at that time, of course, we didn't have these. But at that time, the platform was the member. And if you consider the khutbas that the Prophet ﷺ delivered, regrettably, we don't have a record of them. It's one of those strange situations in our Islamic history. But we do have a record of the Prophet's khutbatul wida, the last khutbah or the khutbah that he delivered in the one and only hajj that he performed. We have a record of that. Uh, if, if you brothers and sisters have seen uh, uh, my book on the, the Prophet's letters and treaties, uh, Power Manifestations of the Sira, we've included it in that. That is preserved. But if you study it, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is not talking in that khutbah about how to make wudu or how long your beard should be or how high your trousers should be, which seems to be the obsession nowadays in most of the masajid and members of, of, the, of the imams, etc. The Prophet ﷺ talked about real issues, what confront the Muslims and what will confront the Muslim ummah in the future. So if we want to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, why is it that we have not grown out of this ritualistic ideas and come to the real issues that face us today? Now let's come to the, the question that Brother Farid posed, the contemporary situation. I don't know how many, you know, I'm not familiar with your situation, but if your situation in South Africa is anything like the rest of the Muslim world, I doubt it very much if the Imams or the Khatibs etc. talk about what challenges the Muslims are facing today, especially in Palestine. You know, you can correct me, but my understanding is, uh, I know in Canada there are very few masajid, they'll perhaps talk about 
perhaps please donate some money to their cause, etc., which is very good. Of course, we must do that. But that's, you know, feeding your Palestinian brothers and sisters is not going to liberate them. Of course, you will save some lives, which is very, very important. But we don't go into the root causes of the problems, understand the root causes of the problem, that uh, what is required of us to do. Now, of course, you know, if you look at the situation in uh, occupied Palestine, particularly in, in Gaza, the horrendous destruction that has been brought upon by those uh, people over there, uh, virtually the whole of the infrastructure of Gaza is destroyed. Uh, out of 36 hospitals, only five are partially functional. No university is left standing, no school is left standing, libraries have been destroyed, bakeries have been destroyed, food is being prevented, water is being prevented, medicines are being prevented from entering over there. Uh, you know, it's something that, that uh, you know, keeps me awake often at night when I think about it, that in Gaza, uh, because of the massive bombings and the number of children that have been killed and injured, etc., uh, children badly wounded whose limbs have to be cut and regrettably there is no anesthesia. Now just imagine a four or five year old child uh, held back by people, uh, a, a, you know, cloth on his face so that his screams can be muffled and the surgeon using uh, knives to cut his limbs without anesthesia. When we get hurt, we, we cut our finger a little bit and, you know, we, we can feel the pain. Just imagine if somebody were to come and cut your finger without anesthesia, how it would feel. Just imagine these young children, four or five years old. There was, in fact, a, a case of a particular child, uh, a young girl about four years old. Her father was a surgeon. And her father is now amputating his own daughter's leg. You know, when, when children have uh, surgery, etc., the parents are not allowed into the surgical ward. They are asked to sit outside and the doctor and the nurses, you know, carry out the operation. Of course, with anesthesia. Now, here is a situation. You have a father cutting the limb of his own child. And, of course, that young girl died on the operation theater because of pain. These are the situations that we face over there. But we, know, we need to look at the larger picture. This is the suffering of our people in Gaza and in the West Bank, and now it has been extended to uh, Lebanon as well. Our Palestinian brothers and sisters in what is referred to as the Islamic resistance, uh, they're not only fighting the Zionists, they are fighting the entire collective West led by the United States. Because since October of 2023, the U.S. has supplied something like $50 billion in weapons to the Zionist entity to carry out these uh, massacres, this genocide of the Palestinian people. Britain, Germany, and Italy are other countries that are involved in this, supplying weapons. And then you have, as Imam Alasi pointed out, we have these uh, so-called quote-unquote Muslim regimes providing food and fuel coming through the Arabian Peninsula, through Jordan, going into occupied Palestine. Fuel that is used by the Zionists, planes, tanks, etc., to carry out the slaughter of the Palestinian people. So we are forced to ask, we are Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us one ummah, but where is that one ummah? What is it that these regimes lead them into providing support to the genocidal Zionists and not help the Palestinian people who are suffering so much. And look at the people or the countries that are supporting the Palestinian people. 
we all know, and of course we don't want to get into the sectarian nonsense, but I mean, it's a reality that the Palestinians are quote-unquote Sunnis. We are both from the Sunni background, although there are people who make <laughs> allegations against us that we are Shias. 